Take your Bible, turn to the book of James. I hate to, it's, it's a good spirit we have here. And uh, some of the things I'm going to say are going to be, I'm going to try to say it in that spirit. Because this is a hard, this is a hard message. The last two have been building up to this one. And it's a, it's a hard message. Uh, I've tried to mimic Reg Kelly in some things. And I'm just thankful that Reg Kelly's Reg Kelly, Mike Hoggard's Mike Hoggard. Uh, cause when I mimic people, I'm not good at it. So I'm just gonna be me this morning. And I'm gonna say some things. To us here at Bethel. Um, as mom said, 1974, she was invited by James Bonds. Not a double agent, but James Bonds and Mary Bonds, and they were coming to this little church and they were building this building here and I remember going over to the one at Gamble Cemetery a few times and then coming to this one for the church dedication. And we've been here ever since. But um, in all the years that I've been here, if you've been in church a long time, you've seen this. You've seen people that you thought were right with God and solid with God. And over time, you found out that not only they weren't, they never were. And I believe in the doctrine of salvation. I believe when God truly saves somebody, they're going to heaven. But I also know from scriptures that there are people... They're given different names in the Bible. Sometimes they're called false brethren. Sometimes they're called wolves in sheep's clothing. But Matthew and Mark and Luke, to some extent, they all tell the parable of the seed and the sower. And how as the seed goes out, there are at least two groups that received the seed of the word of God, that either because of sin or because of a hardness of their heart, it only grows for a little while, it's choked out, and they die bearing no fruit, That's they're not going to heaven. It's only those that are sown on good ground, that's the ones that are going to heaven. And I, I just kind of struggled for a long time. What to call those people? And I think I've settled on what the Bible calls them. Now I'm going to tell you what it is in a minute. James chapter 2 verse 14. What did the prophet brethren, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be you warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what did the prophet? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works. If you're really saved, it'll show. If you really believe what you say you believe, it will be manifested in your life. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O, o uh, vain man, that's another word for him, vain men, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body 
without the Spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Father, I need your help to preach this message or I won't preach it. I'll sit down. And I pray, dear God, that you would help me to preach it in the right spirit. Help me to have the right attitude. Help me to, dear God, please, don't let me be in my flesh in any way. Father, I love you. I reverence this book. And Father, I cannot ever stand up in front of a congregation of your people and say that I deserve salvation or that I deserve grace or I deserve faith or I deserve to preach because none of that's true. And Father, when it comes to committing things that are sins against you, I've done it. And I will do it again. So Father, remind me of that while I'm preaching today. Remind me, God, that there's something in my eye to be taken out before something in somebody else's eye can be taken out. So Father, preach to me while I preach this message that I be not a hypocrite. God, help us, Father, to take heed to your word this morning. These are stern warnings that if any of us, any of us, from the pulpit to the pews, finds ourselves not being in obedience to this book, God, that you would chastise us, you would take a rod of correction to us, and that, Father, we would receive that correction. Help us, dear God, to not be hypocrites. Help us to take warning from your word, to learn, Father, what defines that, so that we can avoid it. Help us, dear God, to not use the words that are preached today as a weapon against our brother or our sister. But help us, dear God, to judge our own selves only. And then, God, you'll judge the rest. And, Father, if they're your children, you'll chastise them. If not, they will be the bastard of Bethel. And Father, just help us, dear God, as we take heed to your word. Father, we love you and we ask for your grace and your blessing in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. If I were to ask you this morning what defines a hypocrite, I think probably, and I, I, I've just kind of been building up to this in the previous two messages, as God laid this on my heart when I began to study it out, it started out just as a message about doing what God said, not just hearing what God said, not just carrying a King James Bible, not just saying amen in a message or a sermon, things that you like, but actually letting God do in us what God wishes to do in us so that we be not hypocrites, so that the world looks at us and says they are who they say they are. They're, if they say they're born again, they're born again. If they say they're right with God, they're right with God. But understand this. That in my lifetime, in my short lifetime, I've seen a lot of people who said they were right with God and had a lot of people fooled. The life that they lived in the short hour or two that they were inside this place was nothing like the life that they lived in the car going home, in the house that they lived in, in the place that they worked, the areas that they shopped or did their marketing in. Outside of the two or three hours they spent in this place, 
their life was the exact opposite of what they portrayed in this place. And then you find out after a while, especially if that church is going to be preaching this book, that after a while they can't take that. Their spirit, they just got a, they got a bad devil spirit in them and they just won't tolerate Bible preaching and they'll buzz out. Sometimes they just don't go to church anywhere. Sometimes they go find a church where things not going to be preached on and they feel comfortable there. Because you're not going to sit here and tell me that these churches all over Jefferson County, that everybody in there saved and born again, they're right with God. You're not going to tell me that. I don't believe it. Especially with what we see coming out of these churches. When a congregation of people hires themselves a pastor who does not believe the Bible, it's because they themselves do not believe the Bible. And they're not, they have no intention on living it. So that's what these churches are full of. And as far as I'm concerned, from what I can see in the Bible, they are hearers of the word, but they are not doers. And they're not doers because they do not believe what they say they believe. They're hypocrites. Romans 2.13, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 20, For the kingdom of God is not in word. You say, but what, what, you believe the Bible, right? Yeah, I do. And you can, you can say, I believe the Bible, and I agree with it. But be lost in saying that. And God's Spirit not doing anything in you to manifest what it is that you say you believe. And eventually, like I say, it, it shows up. It shows up in church. The kingdom of God is not in word. It's not you going around telling everybody how saved you are and how right you are. Or how you believe this Bible, or how you believe this doctrine, or how, how more righteous you are on certain days. It's not what you say. It is what you do. That's what displays whether or not you're right with God or not. So, there are several places in the Bible where the word hypocrite is found and where it's used, and this is how it's defined. So, the all I can do here Instead of me judging you or you judging me, I can give you the Word of God, I can expound on the Word of God, but then it is up to God to work that in you or to manifest that either yes, you are who you say you are as a believer or no, you're not who you say you are. And God always has a way of exposing that, does He not? I mean, people think that hypocrites get away with everything. They don't. They don't. God is the one who is the revealer of secrets, is He not? He's the one that exposes who people really are. He's the one that shows it. You, when you find out something about somebody, that's because God wanted that thing found out. So here's who the hypocrites are. Job chapter 15, you can follow along with me in the scripture. In fact, I recommend it that you get your Bible out. You underline these passages. Make notes on them. I'm like, I'm like Jason. Jason said, I like these people sit down with, during the church service and make notes. And I did. I sat over there while Jason was preaching, while Reg was preaching. I made notes. Things that I needed to hear. Things that I wrote down. Things that... What's coming to me about messages that I can preach? Have your Bible open. Underline these phrases. Make notes on them. Job chapter 15 verse 34. For the congregation of the hypocrites shall be desolate. Look at your Bible. It actually says that there can be a congregation that is a hypocrite. A whole church can be hypocritical. The whole thing. That would include the pastor. That would include everybody in the pews. It is possible that an entire church can be a fraudulent church. Not a real church. Not saved. Not born again. Not led by the Spirit. Not manifesting the fruits of God's Spirit. They are, in fact, hypocrites. But the congregation of the hypocrites are desolate. You know what that means? They meet together... They say they're meeting together in the name of God, 
But God is not there. God has, has placed the title of Ichabod over that congregation. And God will never again show up in that place. Do you know what does show up in that place? I would draw your attention to passages in Isaiah chapter 13. In verse 20, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. A shepherd is a pastor, a shepherd is Christ. And what he's saying here is that Jesus will not show up there. But he said, but wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and the houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. Wild beasts, who saw what I said in PMO Thursday? Who's, who watched PMO Thursday? You ought to watch it. Did you see the satyrs, Philip? They're there, aren't they? This Bible's right. You know what satyrs are? Devils. Devils. Devils in the house of God. Wild beasts. Dragons in their pleasant palaces. Serpents. Devils. Inside of a church instead of the Spirit of God. Devils in your car going home. Because of what you're listening to on the way home. Because the music you listen to going home from church or going to work or going around the house. Devils show up. Devils, dragons and satyrs, monsters. Show up, turning people into monsters. Doing things that people ought not do. Saying things that people ought not say. Devils in people's mouths and in people's tongues. Saying things that should never be said. Lying, telling lies that should never be told. People claim they have the Spirit of God. They claim that they believe the Bible. But they are hypocrites and they are desolate of the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God oftentimes is a restrainer of our deeds. Is He not? Does not the Holy Ghost keep us from doing things that we want to do? That we shouldn't do? And fire shall consume the tabernacles. Listen to this. Tabernacles. That's a church. Fire shall consume the tabernacles of bribery. Hmm. I wonder if that church of the Notre Dame in Paris, if that matches what this is, out, is, is about. Fire consuming that church. Destroying all those nasty idols in there. But it's a tabernacle of bribery. Because how many people do you think pay tithes or give offerings to a church as a means of soothing their own souls for their sins. How many people do you think do that? I hope it's not done here. If it, if it is, take it back. I don't want it. I don't want anything to do with it. If you've ever given a dime to this place in order to soothe your soul or as a means of controlling I've had people send money to this ministry and then proceed to tell me that they sent money to this ministry and make demands of me. And I don't play that game. And I never will. Because I don't want God to consume this place with fire. That'd be hypocritical, would it not? Job chapter 20 verse 5, the triumphing of the wicked is short and the joy of the hypocrite, but for a moment. See, hypocrites always trying to win battles. They're always trying to jockey for position. They're always trying to get their way on everything. Sometimes they use money to do it. Sometimes they use brute force to do it. Sometimes they use their mouth to do it. But they're always trying to get their way. 
And believe it or not, some people, when they win their little battle, they say that that's because God was on their side. But the Bible's telling you that the triumphing of the hypocrite and of the wicked is but for a moment. It's short. You may have won this little battle. You may have won. You may have gotten your way on this issue. You may have mouths enough to where everybody has to cater to what you do and say. But your triumphing is going to be short-lived. Job 27, 8. For what is the hope of the hypocrite? What, what is, what is, why would somebody, why would somebody be in church, sit in the house of God, and pretend to be saved, pretend to be born again, their life outside of the house of God does not match what they convey on the inside of the house of God, so they are being hypocritical about it, and what do they hope to gain? Do they think that because they make a fair showing on Sunday, that that's acceptable to God and God will overpass and, and, or pass over all of their other transgressions? That's what the Pharisees thought. The Pharisees of Jesus' day thought that because of their, their religious garb and their religious titles and their religious functions that they did, that that, then not God would pass over all of their other sins. And that's a lie, is it not? What is the hope of the hypocrite, though he hath gained, when God taketh away his soul? That sounds like that story that Jesus told about the man that filled all of his barns. And then when all of his barns got full, he decided to build more barns. And he kept building, and he kept building, and he kept building. And finally God told him, What shall it profit you if you've gained the whole world if you're going to lose your own soul? Let me ask you the question. What, what, which one of your sins is worth hanging on to that you would risk losing your own soul over? What proud moment do you have that you hang on to that's worth losing your own soul over? What is it that your pride keeps you from confessing that's worth losing your soul over? Let me ask this question. Who is it that you can't forgive and won't forgive that's worth losing your soul over? I would... I'm almost tempted to ask for you to raise your hand if anybody here has unforgiveness in their heart. I'm not going to do that. That's, that ain't right. But I'll be honest with you. I can see it in your faces. So I'm going to look down here for a while. What is it that you're hanging on to that you will not confess? What sort of pride do you have in your heart that you will not let go of that's worth losing your soul? Because hypocrites, hypocrites don't go to heaven. I'll say it like Brother Kelly said years ago in a message he preached on wolves and sheep's clothing. He said, I'm going to give you some deep theology. Wolves and sheep's clothing are not sheep. And when he said that, I just went, that is amazing. I never thought of it that way. But they're not. Hypocrites are lost people blaspheming God with every breath they take because they think they're going to heaven and they're not. Psalm 35. JR, would you go in my refrigerator? Since Chris built me this little cup holder here, get me, there's a bottle in there with some tea in it. Would you come and get that for me? Because I'm not quite done yet. Psalm 35, turn there. Now, 
Now, I'm going to take a guess this morning. Thank you very much. You didn't drink out of it, did you? Chris, thank you for that cup holder, buddy. I want to take a guess and say that there's probably people sitting here who have been abused and attacked either physically or emotionally or verbally by hypocrites. Am I right? You've been maligned by somebody who thought they were better than you. Let me tell you something about racism. Racism is hypocritical at its core, is it not? Racism says that I am better than you. God made me superior than you because of the color of my skin and how my hair looks like. And therefore, I can mock you and attack you and hate you and despise you because I am this color and you're that color. That's racism and that's hypocritical. And by the way, I did not believe that Reg Kelly preached any kind of racism here Thursday night. He was telling the truth. They're racist on both sides. Okay? And it's messed up. And I won't have it here. Okay? I won't have it here. And I will tell you that there are people who have left this church mouthing me because of my daughter's mixed marriage. And they lied to my face about why they left because they didn't want to face me and tell me why they left. Hypocrites. Got no use for them. So Psalm 35, look at it. But in mine adversity, they rejoiced. Now let me tell you, the hypocrites are always waiting for you to go down. Mom, they've said it about me more than once. Hoggard's going down. Hoggard's going down. And when I heard that, I had to go to the Lord to ask if it was true. In mine adversity, they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the abjects gathered themselves together. Do you, does anybody here know what an abject is? Or who an abject is? Phil, you know? An abject. I had to look it up, but it makes sense. Ab means out of. Ject, we have a word called reject. Okay? Or when you fire the gun, what happens after the bullet goes out? What happens to the shell? Eject. So you get the word, right? Abject means that they're out. They've been thrown out. They've been put out. You following me? That means that they're not, they're not here. They are abjects. And the abjects gathered themselves against me. Let me tell you about Reg Kelly. How he preached here is how he preaches at his church. He don't put on something else when he comes here just for us because we're the rotten people. He's preached that way at his church. And did you know that he told me several years ago and it's still going on. There is a church that meets on the other side of Norwood, Missouri. That is the everybody who is mad and has been hurt by Reg Kelly church. First church of everybody who has been mad at Reg Kelly. Then there'll be a second one because they'll split before too long. But he's called me at times. said, Mike, will you pray for me? Why? He said, they're just gathered against me. It just seems like everybody that I try to help and I try to work with and I try to love and I try to do things for, but I got to sit down with them and tell them the truth. Then they get mad. Or usually their wife gets mad. 
Some little Jezebel gets mad, and then they pull out, and then they start working against me from the outside. Those are abjects. There are abjects from this church who have tried to destroy this church from the outside and then from the inside. The abjects gathered themselves together against me and I knew it not. You know why I knew it not? Because they wouldn't say it to my face. Or they wouldn't say it to your face. They did tear me and cease not. With hypocritical mockers in feast, they gnashed upon me with their teeth. So let me tell you something about hypocrites. Hypocrites hate Bible-believing Christians. Hypocrites hate saved people. They hate them. And they stop at nothing to try to destroy them. I've been in this church a long time. I saw a pastor. I loved every pastor that I was under in this church. I loved them. My mama would bring me here and I would work with that pastor. Even as a boy, I would work with him. Do anything in the world for him. And there was one pastor I loved. That while he was gone on vacation, they had a board meeting against him behind his back to try to throw him out. And that culminated in probably the nastiest church business meeting I have ever seen in my whole life. That's the one where the deacon got slapped by a Jezebel woman. That should have never happened here. And I swore it would never happen again if I had anything to do with it. If you wonder why we don't have board meetings and business meetings all the time, that's one of the reasons why. If you don't trust me, vote me out. But I'm not going to hurt this church. Okay? But I've seen it happen over and over and over again. The abjects turn against, you can tell when they turn against godly people. And the man that got slapped was probably one of the most godly men I've ever known in my whole life. His name is Dale McCurry. He's going on to be with the Lord now. Saint of a man. The abjects will always work from the outside in. That's the hypocrites. Proverbs 11, 9. An hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. Are you still with me? You go to church and you say amen and you shout hallelujah and you hug everybody's necks here and then you go home and you're a wrecking ball. You turn against your neighbors, you turn on your co-workers, you turn on your own family. The next set of messages that I think God's laying on my heart to preach are the two commandments that we're under. What are the two commandments? Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Ron? Sandy's your neighbor. Say hi, neighbor. Why would you destroy your own neighbor? Why would you act spiritual here and then go out from this place and destroy the people who know you go to church here? Isaiah chapter 9. Boy, I'm up here shaking. I don't want to preach this. What I'd want to do is go sit down. Isaiah 9. Verse 17. Therefore the Lord shall have no joy in their young men. 
Neither shall have mercy on their fatherless and widows. One of the things that I'm wanting to do more than anything in this church is for us to display to these young men and these young boys in this church how Christian people are supposed to act. Because this boy, as a boy here in this church, saw how Christian people are not supposed to act. And it bothered me. It affected me for a long time. So, God, you listen now. If we're going to be a hypocritical church, God's going to take it out on these young boys here. And God won't have any mercy on them. For everyone is an hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaketh folly. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. You ought to be thankful that God is reaching out to you to this very day to try to get you to repent. Maybe, maybe, he's not turned his back on you altogether. Isaiah 32, verse 6. Isaiah 32, verse 6. For the vile person will speak villainy. Now look, now look, at, the, look at the impact of that statement. A vile person and what comes out of their mouth, Gary? Villainy. See, it always, it always comes out who you really are. Does it not? It'll come out in your actions, or it'll come out of your deeds, it'll, your, what's in your thoughts will usually come out. And sometimes they come out of your mouth. If you are vile, then your villainy comes out of your mouth. And what that is, you're just telling everybody in the world who you are. His heart will work iniquity, To practice hypocrisy. Like hypocrisy needs to be practiced. Like it needs to be perfected somehow. To utter error against the Lord. And to make empty the soul of the hungry. And it will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. Do you know what this is saying to us? That our hypocritical actions and our hypocrisies have an effect on people who would be saved. But now they see you and the things that you do and they say, if that's Christianity, I want nothing to do with it. And they go on hungry. The instruments also of the churl are evil. He deviseth wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words and even when the needy speaketh right. Matthew chapter 6. I don't know how much more I'm going to give you. Let's see what I got. Boy, I got a lot. Here's here's how hypocrites always are. Now, I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to tell you like it is. I have more respect for a lost man who admits that they're a lost man. I got more respect for an atheist who admits that they're an atheist. A couple weeks ago, in fact, week before last, I did a Pastor Mike Online episode where a pastor, pastored mega churches all over the place, done all kinds of things for 20 years, came out and admitted he didn't believe God anymore. He was an atheist. Didn't believe the Bible. He blamed every, he's like, he's like a, a spoiled millennial. He blamed everybody in the world except for himself. But at least he came out of the church and said, I don't believe it. That's better, as far as I'm concerned, than somebody in the church who says they believe it, but they really don't believe it. That's a hypocrite. 
Matthew chapter 6, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues, in the street, in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Hypocrites, they just like showing up, looking spiritual, looking right, looking Christian. But they're not. But they want, for some strange reason, they want everybody to think that they're the Holy One. Verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now Matthew 7, I'm going to stop here. Turn your Bible to Matthew 7. Why am I preaching this? Why do I have to preach it? Because Michael's going to Kenya. And I'm telling you, when Michael goes to Kenya, devils explode in this place. Don't they? They explode in this place. They go after me. They go after Michael. I'm glad Michael's down here because we're going to pray. We're going to lay hands on him, pray for him. We're going to cover him because he's going, he's going, he's going to hell this week. He's going in the pit of Satanism. And Satan's domain to work over there. And we're going to, he's not going out of here alone. We're going to pray for him. And we've given him meals ready to eat. So he has something to eat and snacks. And you like Vienna sausages? Do you really? Because if you don't, I'll eat them. Okay, all right. But when he goes to Kenya, devils climb all over him. And there's been times when he's, that he's come back. He has gone through hell. When he goes to Kenya, devils climb on his wife. And she goes through hell. And when he goes to Kenya, Satan jumps at our people in their marriages, in their homes, their children. And it, it gets to the point to where I don't want to send him anymore. Because I'm scared of what's going to happen. And then it makes me want to just get out. So all the devils leave you people alone. Including my own family. And I don't like that. But what will happen is God will expose hypocrisy here. In days past, I have had the unfortunate responsibility of going to people who were part of this church to say things that I never wanted to say. To say things to people who used to be part of this church. To confront them about things that I know they're doing. And I don't like that. Matthew 7 verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine eye? 
thou hypocrite. First cast the beam out of thine own eye. And then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. If you have ever, and you listen to me, church, if you have ever gossiped about somebody in this church, you ought to repent or you're a hypocrite. If you've ever accused anybody in this church of anything without going to them first, like the Bible says, you're a hypocrite. You know why? Because you don't care about biblical restoration. All you care about is looking more righteous than somebody else. And I've had it. It needs to stop. Can I hear God's people say amen?